when you, uh, I would say chapter 2, verses uh, 7, 17 through 29, uh, I was thinking about like, what basically is this? And it, it, to me, as I look at it and read it, uh, it's a rude awakening, uh, spiritually speaking. And when you look back at your life, if you were to pick uh, some of your initial rude awakenings as a person, uh, you probably already have them in mind, like, oh yeah, that really shocked me. Uh, when you thought everything was great, and all of a sudden, bam, something happened, it just kind of blew your world uh, wide open. When I, when I was in high school, as a freshman back in 72, yes, people were alive back then, um, 1972, went to high school, and, and I was a baseball player, so I told my dad, you know, to kind of stay in shape for baseball, I'm going to go out for football. Oh, that was a great idea. Uh, they put me in a, as a linebacker, and I was like, oh, great. Um, and that was, that, was, that was hard. But I was in great shape. At, at the, I grew up near Yuma, near El Centro, California, very hot in the desert. So when you put on full gear, and it's 120 degrees, it would change your life. And I decided that football was not God's will for my life. Um, and so, uh, but I was in great shape. So I thought, well, you know, we're heading into the winter season. How can I stay in shape for baseball? I'll go out for the wrestling team. How hard can that be? Asked a couple guys, you know, where do you guys practice? We, we, they showed me the room. I'm thinking, this is it? I mean, just work out in this room? I'm in a piece of cake. Yeah, right. Yeah, after my first week of wrestling practice, I remember distinctly sitting at the dinner table. Uh, my parents had kept the spaghetti ready for me, and it was in a bowl, and it was sitting there, and I was staring at it with my hands on my lap, thinking, how can I raise my hand up there to grab that fork? That's how tired I was. And my mom like, honey, what's the matter with you? I can't move my arms. I've gripped guys for hours every day. I have nothing left. So I told my dad when he came home from work from the port of entry where he was at as a customs officer, I said, dad, I really think, I, I, I just, this wrestling thing's not for me. I think I just need to quit. And his deep bass southern drawl, he's like, son, we didn't raise quitters in this family. I'm like, great. <laughs> Oh, that, that whole thing was a wake-up call for me, a rude awakening. Uh, it happens physically in life to you. It also happens spiritually that uh, you, you get awakened, hopefully, in your life. Uh, and uh, Jesus talks about uh, the ultimate wake-up day, uh, which Paul is going to talk about. Because in Romans 2, he's talking about judgment day. Uh, and he's talking about Judgment Day to his Jewish brethren, trying to wake them up spiritually uh, by addressing what the gospel is that they reject and their need of the Messiah. He's talking about Judgment Day. But the ultimate Judgment Day discussion comes from Jesus himself. We've talked about this before. Review is a good thing. Uh, Matthew 7, what does Jesus say what happens on Judgment Day? Here's what Jesus says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, in your name, did we not prophesy? Uh, in your name, didn't we cast out demons? In your name, did we not perform miracles? Jesus says, when those people stand before my throne and argue with me about all their works, but they rejected me, you know the words that he says to them. He says, I will look to them and say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. I can think of no more ominous thing for God to tell you face to face. Now, if you use narcissistically tried to prove I should get into heaven based on my works. You know, our world is littered with people who think they're going to get into heaven based on their work as they reject the work of Christ. Uh, one of my doctoral classes that I took this semester, and I am finished by the way, I hit the send button on my transgender dissertation on Tuesday. That was like a whoa moment when I hit send, you know. Uh, so it's over. I'm done. I'm finished. Thank you. Uh, for bearing with me, but um, I graduate next, uh, next uh, Saturday morning at 10 o'clock in Charlotte, so that's going to be fun. By the way, I was going through my attic. Strange things are in your attic, are they not? I was going through a box looking for something, and I came across my high school graduation tassel from 1976. Remember the year? Did you graduate then? Bicentennial, red, white, and blue, Liberty Bell on it, 1976 and everything, and I'm looking at it. It's all faded now. And I'm thinking, you know, if you would have told me in 76 when I was 18 that I would be graduating from school when I'm 60, I, I would have probably just passed out at that point. Anyway, so I was taking this doctoral class uh, this last semester here, and it was on uh, advanced cults, and it was on Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, and having them in my family, I found it most intriguing. But So I had to read all of their writings, uh, uh, tons of books that they've written, doctrinal books, encyclopedias that they've published, etc., uh, and I was reading, and I'm making all kinds of notes as I'm reading their books. Uh, they're very crafty on when they talk about salvation. Because on the one hand, they tell you, you've got to have faith to be saved. But then they take it away and say, oh no, you must work to get into God's presence. I was reading uh, their book, What the Bible, What Does the Bible Really, that's italicized, really teach. This little book is supposed to tell you. 
Well, trust me, it, it, it doesn't tell you, but here's what they say about salvation. Quote, water baptism is a requirement. Requirement? I underlined it in green ink. A requirement for all who want to have a relationship with Jehovah God. Really? I thought you were saved by, by what? Faith. Faith. Not by baptism. That's what they say. Uh, and they say, you must do this publicly, blah, blah, blah. And then they go on in the ensuing pages and explain to you, oh, but if you want to get baptized by us, and then they list all the hoops you must jump through before they approve the fact that you should get baptized. Really? That's interesting. And so then they uh, have a discussion in here later on in this chapter regarding uh, after your baptism, like, how do you stay in the love of God? Really? Uh, well, how you stay in the love of God, translated, how do you stay saved, is you do all the works they say you should do. So on the one hand, what does the cult do? You've got to be saved by grace. And then over here, they take it away. And it, oh, it's works. It's works. What did Jesus say? Many will stand before me on that day of judgment with their works, and I will say to them, don't care about the works. I just care about the inner work of your life. See, this is what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 2. Uh, he's talking to the Jews who are big on the outer works. Form, ritual, love of the law, the fact they're a Jew. All that stuff they thought is what makes them saved in God's perspective. In Romans 2, Paul is uh, talking to them because by way of review, uh, he's telling them, because they just listened to his discussion about the Gentile in chapter 1, and all the Jews are like high-fiving each other going, yeah, that's the goyim, all right. Those are the Gentiles. They are so evil. We have the law. We are Jews. We are saved. Paul says, well, you're not saved if you don't know the Messiah. And his work counts above all. And so he's going to take this. So we want to review, right? Because brain cells die daily. I'm sure it's, and it's been two weeks, right? So we're re going to review for a minute. Verse one, what's he talk about? Day of judgment. He's going to give you the reason for divine judgment. And then in verse, verses two to four, he's going to tell you the rightness of God's judgment. Then when it comes, uh, he presents the facts of why eternal punishment is due unto you who rejected his son. Verses 5 through 11, he's going to talk about a vault that uh, is a heavenly kind of vault that each man's name is on his own vault. And if you don't know the Christ, you make deposits into that daily. And one day he says the vault's full. So when God's judgment comes, it's based on the facts of what's in the vault. And then verse 12 to 29, which is what we're still talking about, he talks about the reality of judgment. Uh, chapter uh, uh, 2, verses 12 and following through 16, we talked about how... Uh, God judges based on the law. Two kinds of law. Natural law, which Gentiles get. That's what he talks about in chapter 1. That every man is without excuse. Why? He gave you the natural law to be able to reason toward cause and effect, complexity and design to God. In fact, he actually says you can see the Trinity through the implanted revelation that he's given you, matching with the external world about you. But what does a man do? Remember chapter 1? They suppress the truth of what they believe and they develop false systems of belief. Uh, but he judges you based upon your uh, rejection of the light given unto you. So eternal punishment is based upon, well, how you responded. Everybody responds differently, but all who reject Christ will be judged. Then he tells the Jew, he will judge you based upon your uh, rejection of what the Torah says. Uh, just like he will judge a Gentile, he'll judge you. That's the reality of his judgment. But when he gets to chapter 2, verse 17, uh, the very first word is a contrastive word. Uh, he's going to zero in on his Jewish brethren because he loves them. He wants them to be saved. So notice what he says to them. We're now into the sermon. That was all review. You still with me? You're not? You can't lie in here, okay? Verse 17, what does he say to them? But if you bear the name Jew and you rely upon the law and you boast in God... Stop right there for just a minute. This is a really long sentence. In fact, if you have an if clause, it's supposed to be sum summarized by a then clause, right? If this, then this, right? Cause effect, all right? So he says, now, he doesn't get to the then part until verse 21. It's one giant long sentence. So if you think I speak fast and have really long sentences, I'm just following Paul. Notice what he does. But if you bear the name of a Jew and you rely upon the law and you boast in God and you know his will and you approve of the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, the Torah, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, and you are a corrector of the foolish and a teacher of the immature, having the law, in the law, the Torah, the embodiment and the knowledge of truth. <laughs> That's the if clause. Well, Paul had a lot to say, didn't he? Then he gets to the then part. You, if that's you, then you therefore who teach one another. I have five questions. If you were a teacher, spiritual teacher, uh, do you teach yourself? Oh. 
Uh, you who preach that one should not steal, ever stolen anything? It says, you who say that you should not commit adultery, ever commit it? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, the Torah, th through your breaking of the law, do you dishonor God? Five rhetorical questions. This is interesting. The Jews thought they were all saved because God gave them the law. They're Jews, they're saved. And oh, we got the law too. We're saved because of that too. Paul says, I, I used to think that way, but that's not what saves you. Your works do not save you. Only the work of Christ, the Messiah, saves you. So he's talking to them with this long conditional clause. Uh, and he's going to cover some positive things. So when you, when you look at the fact, the first thing he says is, if you're a Jew, is that a positive or a negative thing? Well, for Paul, it's a positive thing. Who were the Jews? Well, anybody that was living in Judea around the Maccabean period, they claimed that name. But prior to be calling a Jew, what were their names in the Old Testament? Bible Trivia 101. You ready? They were called Israelites, and they were also called Hebrews. They, they had these names, but later on, Maccabean period, they, they accept the name Jew. Paul says this is a positive thing. They were also known as Jews because of their love of the law of the Torah. And that's what he says here. If you are a Jew and you rely upon the law. Now, the rely is a present tense verb in Greek, which means you perpetually rely upon it. Rely upon it for what? Well, as I do it, that's what gets me saved. That's what he's going to argue about. But he said, that's, that's good to be a Jew and rely on the law to a point. And it's good if you have a relationship with God as a Jew uh, through the law uh, to boast in God. That's good boasting. And he said, I, I've been there. I, I understand what that means. Who gave them the law? They just think it up on their own? Have you read the Old Testament? Yeah. What, where, when did that happen? Remember, th they got delivered from uh, Egyptian bondage and they wind up at Mount Sinai. Uh, Jebel Musa, they're around the base of it. There's two million of them. They're a ragtag group of slaves. And, you know, clouds in the Sinai, oh, that happens all the time. You know, when you see clouds in the desert, it's like, a cloud! I grew up in the desert of Southern California. It didn't rain much. You met the Sinai? I've been down in the Sinai. It's not very cloudy there. All of a sudden, a cloud bank forms, falls on top of this one mountain, fire and lightning, trumpet of God, Ground is shaking. God's there. Giving them the what? The Torah. He gave them the Torah. Well, what's a Torah about? It, it's divided into three quadrants if you read Exodus. Exodus 20, verses 1 to 26. God's Torah was about, the law was about moral activity. Let's see, what does God want exactly? He's going to tell you. Moral activity. Uh, civil activity is in the law, Exodus 21. And then ceremonial activity is in Exodus chapter 23. God says, I'm going to cover all of your life. I gave the goyim. Who are the goyim? The Gentiles. I gave them natural revelation. I'm going to give you Jews special revelation. And by the way, if you go back to Deuteron Deuteronomy 7, when God says, you know, through the pen of Moses, uh, let's recap the law. Uh, why did I call you to be my people? Because you're the greatest of all people? No. God says in Deuteronomy 7, I chose you to be my people because you're the least of the people. But I want you to be a, a channel of blessing to the world. The only problem was they became a bucket of the blessing and would not share it with the Goyim, the Gentile. But the law came from God. Paul says, I love the law. I mean, read Psalm 119. The whole Psalm is talking about the greatness of the law of God. God gave it. But the law was also uh, meant to design to teach them exactly what God wanted from them. So if you're reading through the Bible, Genesis is fun to read. It's narrative. Exodus is fun. What's next? Yeah, Leviticus. You kind of, kind of slow down there, right? Wow. You know, uh, my senior year at Dallas Seminary, I took a class because uh, I was a Hebrew major. So I took a class on the exegesis of, of, of Leviticus. Uh, that was interesting. It, I mean, it truly was. Uh, but you find out in the first seven chapters exactly what God wants from you if you want to get into his presence. It's pretty simple. It starts out the first chapter. You got to have a burnt offering. You know, lamb of the first year. Sacrifice, confess your sin on it. Your sin's transferred to the little lamb. Uh, the priest then uh, kills the lamb, spills its blood, puts it up on the altar. God's wrath is displaced from you to the lamb. It's burned, it's consumed. God's wrath is removed by the sacrifice. Points to the Messiah, Jesus, of course. But God said, this, I'm gonna tell you exactly how to get into my presence. You must follow it explicitly. When you look at the Jews, God had blessed them greatly by telling them exactly what he wanted from them. Uh, that's why he says in verse uh, 19 of chapter 2 of the book of Romans, you, you are a guide to the blind. 
as Jewish people, the, the goyim, the Gentiles. They only have natural revelation. You have the law of God. You are a light to the blind. You're, you're a light to those who are in darkness. You are a corrector of the foolish who, who believe the wrong things about God. You are a teacher of the immature. Uh, Isaiah chapter 42 is most interesting in the, in the Old Testament, the prophets. Uh, Isaiah uh, in chapter 6 uh, says some words who, that apply prophetically to the Messiah, but Jews saw this as their role in the world. Notice what God says through Isaiah. I am the Lord. I've called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand. I will watch over you. I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, the goyim, uh, to open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and to those who dwell in darkness from prison. When the Messiah comes, he will be the suffering servant and this is his role. Uh, years ago when I sat down with Liz's Jewish side of the family, uh, they're from New York, Brandeis educated, blah, 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 uh, and we had a Thanksgiving meal together, and, you know, we, so we sat down, and they said, there's rules for this dinner. <laughs> okay, like, what are the rules? Okay, uh, well, we can't talk religion, and we can't talk politics. We're liberal, Marty's conservative, he's a Christian, we're Jews, let's just not do any of those things, let's just, let's just have Thanksgiving dinner, Okay. And then during the dinner, one of the Jewish sister-in-laws said, uh, could, she posed a theological question to me. So I said, um, do you want me to answer that? And they all looked at each other. Yeah. Two and a half hours later, we, we quit talking about it. Because they wanted to know, how, you're a Gentile and you know Hebrew? Uh-huh. Like, why? And then how could you believe Jesus is the Messiah? I'm like, how could I not? Like, where's the evidence? Have you read your writings? <laughs> um, tr trust me, they had not. So when you look at Isaiah 42, talking about the Messiah, when he comes, it says he's going to open blind eyes. When Jesus came, what did he do? That's what he did. You had, you're missing eyesight? He gave you eyesight. I mean, only God could do that. But they all saw themselves as a, as a nation, as being the light to the world. That's what they were supposed to be. Paul says, that's all good stuff. The, and Jesus believed it. He believed the Jews had spiritual light. Notice what he tells the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. He wasn't even supposed to be talking to her for two reasons. Why? She's a Samaritan, a half-breed Jew, and she's a woman. He travels through Samaria. No Jew would even walk in Samaria. And the, so Jesus goes into Samaria. His disciples are like, what are you doing? Who are you talking to? What does he tell her in uh, chapter 4, book of John, verse 22? He tells her this. You, they had an alternate worship system as Samaritans. You worship that which you do not know. He just condemned her whole religious system. Wow, is God direct. We, Jews, worship what we do know. Why? For salvation is of the Jews. See, Jesus looked at the Old Testament and said, oh yeah, that's the way to salvation. It, we've got it. You do not. See, he loved her enough to tell her the truth. The problem was, according to Paul, they thought possession of the law and being a Jew was tantamount to salvation. They didn't possess the Christ who fulfilled the law. Because if you want to get into heaven based on the law, it's pretty simple what you must, must do to get in. What must you do? How much of the law should you do? Well, you're standing before God on judgment day and you tell God, I'm a Jew and hey, I've done 75% of the law. I'm a 75%er. What God say to you? Uh, no, you must do 100% of the law. And so only one could fulfill a lot, that was Christ. So Paul asked these Jewish brethren who are deceived by their own system, he asked them five rhetorical questions. You therefore who teach another, do you teach yourself? Wow. You know the scariest thing about preaching is when you preach these things on Sunday, there's always a next Sunday coming. Sometimes I'm still convicted about what I talked about this week because it does pertain to my life. And I'm still working on what I talked about here. And then there's another Sunday coming with more topics. And I'm thinking, well, I'm still three weeks back. And I, but, but when you leave here, what's the goal? That you go out and have a really nice lunch at Chipotle or whatever? No. <laughs> that when you leave here, you walk out challenged to be changed. That you live that which you just heard. It's dangerous to sit under the teaching of the Word of God because God holds you accountable to it. So there's nothing, nothing worth than, uh, worse than living in untrafficked truth. I didn't apply it to my life. You know, Paul says, are you a teacher of the law, but you, but you don't obey the law? The answer is, that, well, yeah, I don't, I don't always obey it. You know, it, it, with a church this size, and I kept running into parishioners at my sister's funeral, people walking up I've never met going, hi, we're your online worshipers. It was amazing, shocking, because there's thousands of people online that watch our services. It was cool. But I told my wife, it's like, it would be hard for me to do something like 
edgy, spiritually speaking, sinfully, because someone's going to be there that goes here. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, I was in Denver this week, flying back from Spokane. The place is packed. I'm waiting for my Southwest plane to take off. Uh, Liz had an early bird ticket, so she got in earlier to get me a, a you know, seat. And so she's on the plane. I'm getting on the plane. I set my backpack down. And as I set my backpack down, the guy behind me goes, hey, Pastor Marty, how's it going? <laughs> really? Yeah. They're on the plane. It's like I told Liz, it's like, wow. I mean, you never know who's watching your life, right? So what does Paul say to them? If you teach another, do you actually do what you're talking about? Uh, if you preach to one, do you not to steal? Really? Are you stealing anything? You know? Uh, and if you say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit it? And by the way, what would they say? Oh, been married 40 years. Been faithful all those years. Jesus then came along, if you remember, and said, what's the standard of measurement for adultery? If you lusted after someone of the, op, you know, the, someone that's opposite of your wife, just l lusted. He said, you just committed adultery. Try to go through one week and not commit adultery if you're married because we have that carnal body. Is it not true? And he says, uh, if you sinned one time, you broke the entire law. Therefore, you couldn't be saved by your performance. He says, do you rob temples? And then we go, I had to, Paul, I don't rob temple. He goes, have you taken a look at any of the jewelry that you have? Oh, my, my jewelry? You mean my Davidic star? My, uh, my uh, what? What are you talking about, Paul? Well, do you realize that your jewelry was taken uh, from a pagan temple and melted down and you're wearing it? Is this not robbery? Is this not idolatry? I mean, you can, you can just see gulping as he's, as he's going along because he wants to wake them up. What's he telling them? Being a Jew, observing the Torah doesn't save you. It's external stuff. It's form. It's ritual. It's all that stuff. What saves you is faith in the right object, which is Jesus the Messiah. When he gets down to verse 24, he levels with them, and he says in verse 24, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. He just quoted from Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 5. Why did he quote that? Because for years they had been saying one thing, doing another. We would call that person a what? A hypocrite. Don't you hate it? They said this, but look at their life. He says, if you say you are a person of the Torah and you follow God and all that kind of stuff, but you don't consistently, you blaspheme God's name among the Goyim, the Gentiles. You know, maybe stop and look at that and ask myself, do I live consistently so God's name is not blasphemed by my lifestyle? That's a big question. Uh, do I live in such a way that they see the true Christ and what he does for a life? Paul says, you're not living according to the law, therefore you are condemned. So when you think about getting into heaven, how do you think you're getting in there? What does this book say that you, how you get into heaven? What do they say? Well, you've got, you got to believe in Jesus, of course, and they don't even define who he is in biblical fashion. He's just a version of God. But then you've got to do a bunch of works. You know, aren't you glad that you don't have to do a bunch of work to get into God's presence. You just have to trust the work of Christ. You know, it's hard to move away from religious works, and Paul talks about it in verse 25. He goes from the law to circumcision, two things they held in high esteem. He says, for indeed, in a circumcision, Jewish circumcision, is of value if you practice the law. But if you don't practice the law, if you deviate in one thing, you can have circumcision as a male, and it's as if you're not a Jew. That's his argument. I'm sure they just about passed out when he said this. Who gave the Jews circumcision as a sign. God, who'd he give it to? Abraham. It's a sign of the, the covenant of being a Jew. They so believed that it led to salvation. Here's what they wrote in the book of Jubilees, one of their books, chapter 15, verse 26. Anyone who is born whose own flesh is not circumcised on the eighth day, uh, not from the sons of the covenant, eighth day, is not from the sons of the covenant which the Lord made uh, for Abraham, since he is from the children of destruction. There is therefore no sign upon him that he might belong to the Lord, because he is destined to be destroyed and annihilated from the earth and be uprooted from the earth, because he has broken the covenant of the Lord our God by not being circumcised. What did they believe? We're going to heaven because we're Jews. We're going to heaven because we have the Torah. And if you're a male, you're certainly going there if you were circumcised according to what God told Abraham. What does Paul say? If you do not obey what God said to obey, it's as if you're not circumcised. That's unbelievable. Verse 20, 25, he says, If you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Abhorrent thought to the Jew. 
Because they thought you got saved because of the outer work. He says, so if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically circumcised, uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who, though not having the letter of the law and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? It's the great reversal. He said, you can have this physical thing and be a, a Jew, but it doesn't save you. It doesn't save you. And you can be a Gentile and be obedient to the concepts of the Torah. And it, in God's mind, it's as if you were a Jew. Who's really a Jew? What does he say in verse 28? It's very interesting. It says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor his circumcision is that which is outward in the flesh. Notice the contrast. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. The circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not the letter. And his praise is not from man, but from God. Who's a Jew? Uh, my wife's uh, great-great-grandfather, his name was Abraham David Solomon. Abraham David Solomon. He came from Germany to the United States. There is a Gentile, right? Uh, Abraham David Solomon. So greatest patriarch, greatest king, wisest man. I could never have a, a marriage argument at all. She's right. She's shaking her head. Yes, amen. Uh, yeah, I mean, so w would you say that's kind of Jewish? Yeah. Am, it, from God's perspective, am I a Jew? My last name's Baker. That sounds Jewish. From God's perspective, am I a Jew? Yeah. Why? But because I know the Jew, Jesus, it, his work on the cross and the resurrection, my faith in that saves me and makes me spiritually circumcised. It's that which saves you. It's not the outer work. That's what Paul's argument is. And what is spiritual circumcision anyway? He talks about it in Colossians chapter 2. Notice what he says. For in Christ the Messiah, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head of every power and authority. And in him, speaking to Christians, Jew or Gentile, you were also circumcised. He's going to tell you what it is now. In the putting off of what? The old sinful nature. Not with the circumcision done by hands, but with the circumcision done by Christ. When did that happen? At the moment of faith. Uh, when I was at my sister's uh, service on Saturday... Friday, friends came from all over the United States. I mean, people I had grown up with in the, from the 60s on that I've known all my life. Because we were, she, my mom had my sister when she was 16 because my mom was engaged at 15 to my dad who was 21 in the Korean War, go figure. Uh, a week after she turned 16, she got married. And then within that next year, she had my sister. And then when she was 18, she had me. So we were very close. Um, amazing, isn't it? Uh, when, when you think about that, I forgot what I was going to tell you. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, you tried this three times in a row with jet lag. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I, so Friday night we have, a, a, the, uh, we have a big dinner for all the friends and family from all over the United States that have come from Nashville and uh, Florida and all over. It was an awesome time uh, to see people that I had grown up with because our friends are all, uh, we all shared friends, basically. Uh, and it's fun sitting and, and talking to all of to all of those friends. It was very comforting to talk to them. Uh, my one friend, Tim, uh, his dad was my pastor in the 60s who led me to Christ. Uh, I think he was a Navy captain, a chaplain, but he led me to Christ. And uh, I, I was in a Baptist church. He gave an altar call almost every Sunday, and I was too chicken to walk down the whole aisle because I, I was afraid of crowds. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I did is there was old wooden pews. Remember those? When they weren't comfortable and they weren't padded? Yeah. So I sat right there in that pew, that old wooden pew, I knew his dad would come down here. Tim sat next to me, 1967, September the 5th. I decided that I did not know God, and I definitely needed him. That's the day I, I just stood up and walked right over to, do, to Dr. Lind, and he put his arms around me and said, welcome to God's family, Marty. That's the best decision I ever made. What happened that day? Spiritual circumcision. The old sinful self was covered by the blood of Christ. And now I have the resident Holy Spirit to choose holiness over sin. And now I know the Christ. So on Judgment Day, I'm not afraid because I can give account because I know the Savior, the Messiah. And it won't be my works. So I'll stick in front of him to say, consider all I've done. No, I can stand there and say, like my sister, no, I consider what you have done, Christ. You know when that day comes for you? Because remember I told you at the beginning, none of us are getting out of here. What? <laughs> Alive. We all shall stand before God. Are you ready for the day to give account unto him? Christ, 
through Paul's pen is telling you, you come through my work, not your work, and he will redeem you. Let's say, let's pray in God's presence. God, thank you uh, for Paul's clarity, uh, for the power of his teaching. Uh, sometimes hard to hear, uh, sometimes difficult to process, uh, but, but oh so true. We know his words are true. And if anyone among us does not know the Christ, the Messiah, might this day uh, be the one where they walk over to a counselor after the service and say, I want to know Jesus today. And we who know you, thank you for the hope that we have in Christ of what redemption is all about. Might our lives truly reflect who you are in Christ's name. Amen.